Hello everyone, this is General Hand Grenade. Welcome to my war room in Prince George, British Columbia. In today's video, we're going to talk about ships. Specifically, we're going to talk about warships from World War I. And uh, the reason we're doing that is because pretty soon, in the next few months, the game Global War 1914 to 1918 is gonna come out from historical board gaming. I had the pleasure of working on that with um, lots of other guys um, and uh, at Historical Board Gaming and, and I think it's a great game. But um, the reason I'm doing this video today is because it, it gives people a chance to start building their navies before the game comes out, if they want. Now I'm going to show you all the pieces that I use. But really what, what I wanted to show you was just the 3D printed pieces uh, so that um, if you wanted to start collecting 3D printed pieces, then you'll know how many. And I've made up a document here. I'll just quickly show you my computer there. So there's my computer. See, there's nothing fancy about that document. It doesn't need to be fancy. So it's just going to tell you how many of each ship that you're going to need, right? Um, anyway, so um, I'm going to talk to you about the, the ships that are available at Historical Board Gaming and, um, and, and like I said, uh, the document's going to tell you how many of those that you need, right? Anyway, let's get started, shall we? So we're going to take a look at the German Navy first. Um, before we do that though, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of these ships. Uh, just to, to give you an idea of the type of ships that you'll see and then we'll get into the specific ships that you're looking at as well as the other navies that I have. So uh, let's, let's you know what a, a submarine is, right? That's just a regular submarine. And we also have coastal submarines. Now what I've been using for the submarine is just the Axis and Ally submarine and a coastal submarine is the same as the coastal submarine that you get from the 1936 game. And then for a torpedo boat destroyer, um, that I'm just using the neutral, the HBG neutral sculpt for a transport. I'm using that as a torpedo boat destroyer. And the reason I'm using that is because it's the most common boat in this game. And it, uh, it <laughs> buying the, the off-colored ones was just cheap, right? So, uh, and there wasn't just one type of uh, torpedo boat destroyer, like one look. I mean, there was... Uh, there were several different kinds, you know, like there was a few that were built specifically for the task, but really, I mean, they, they, they would put uh, torpedo tubes on any kind of ship that moved fast enough. Like it needed to move fast because they used them for commerce raiding. Uh, but, but then just like the destroyers in World War II, there was all kinds of other duties that, that got uh, put onto these ships, right? So they went from becoming from being torpedo boats to being d torpedo boat destroyers and during world war one they just referred to them as destroyers right um in english anyway i'm, I'm sure the other guys with the other languages called them something different but um english-speaking people just called them destroyers and it evolved from then but this is the early type of destroyer is the torpedo boat destroyer and uh then the last one there I'm using the Axis and Allies transport ship for a naval transport in the game. Um, but there will be uh, new sculpts coming out from HPG, uh, hopefully with the release of the game, and there will be all the unit types that you need in the game. And so who knows if uh, like the torpedo boat destroyer is better, then I might buy those instead of uh, using these ones, right? I mean, if it's a, a lot better than this one. And, um, and we'll just see what the, all the other ones look like as well, right? But I think with the 3D printed sculpts, I'm gonna stick with those because um, there's, they're not gonna have a whole bunch of different types of them, right? And the 3D printed ones are a lot, uh, a lot more detailed. Um, the thing about 3D printed though, and all of these ones down here are 3D printed, is that they're, um, they're not as durable, right? Like you can't grab a, a whole handful of them and pick them up because you be, might be breaking uh, masts off them or if, you know, like if they're tanks, you, you could be breaking gun barrels off or something. Like here, this is an example here. This is the Deutschland class pre-dreadnought for the Germans. And there's a mast missing here, but that's because Doug sent me these and then he realized that uh, 
that these ones needed to be beefed up. And I'll show you, I've got, a, I've got my cruisers for the British where he had beefed up the mass. And, and you'll see, like, uh, there's times that, like, he, he prints them up. Hey, these look good, but they're not as functional as, as they, they could be or should be, right? So I'll be getting a, a bunch more of those um, for the Germans. But anyway, um, uh, if, you, if that happens to you, if you get a, a broken piece of any kind, whether it's plastic or 3D printed, the cost is too high right now to just replace one ship, right? But the next time you make an order, you just put in the comment section um, that, uh, that you got a, had a broken piece of this kind or that kind, and he'll just send it along with, with uh, the next order that you get, right? So anyway, um, let's just talk about these ship types down here now. So first of all, there's the cruiser. Um, this, is, this particular one's an armored cruiser. There was actually different types of cruisers. The first type was just a regular cruiser and it was, um, it, it was built lighter and faster than a battleship. It's smaller, right? The guns weren't as big. It didn't have a bunch of armor on it. What, what that was built for was for the nations that had holdings all around the world and shipping lanes and everything. Um, they needed to police those shipping lanes and protect those ports. And you know, if there was an uprising in one of your colonies, right, uh, the cruiser was actually a pretty powerful ship, right? Um, I mean, it might not have worked against a navy that had a whole bunch of battleships, but you know, we're talking about colonies here, and chances are they didn't have a lot of ships, right? Or at least a lot of sh big ships. So a cruiser might have been the biggest ship around, you know, uh, in certain parts of the world. So it was actually a really useful ship and probably the most widely sh used ship. But you know, in a fight one-to-one uh, -one against a battleship, and that would have been one of these, the, the pre-dreadnoughts, they were the battleship of the day. Um, they would have lost because the, the battleship had bigger guns, it had armor on it, and um, like you needed to, to strike a balance with the cruisers in how much armor you put on because you wanted them to go fast, and you wanted them to go far, right? Um, they needed, you know, they need a lot of miles per gallon, put it that way, right? Uh, whether they were coal fired or later on some of them ran on oil but um, they, they you know like it cost a lot to run the ship around the world and so they didn't really use battleships for that uh, the battleships just had too much armor and too big of guns and they were too expensive they were more uh, used near the home country and there were different types of cruisers like there was that regular cruiser the first one but then uh, they got into uh, a protected cruiser and what a protected cruiser was it was it had uh, down below the waterline it, it had uh, it had armor and that was for torpedoes so a torpedo couldn't sink it right but uh, then the deck guns started getting big better on ships you know more accurate and more powerful so then they went to the armored cruiser and this is the an armored cruiser so that the side of it was uh, protected with armor and so that was an armored cruiser and then by the time world war one came along they still used the armored cruiser but it was the battle cruiser that took over for that and the reason was because the battle cruiser had uh, a better propulsion system so it could have bigger guns and more armor and still go fast if not faster than the armored cruisers right definitely faster than the uh the pre-dreadnoughts but anyway that's what the cruiser was and then the, the pre-dreadnought was the battleship of, of the day and it was built, uh, they started building them like that. They, they took over for the ironclads about the mid 1880s. And that only lasted for about 20 years because then a new type of propulsion system was invented and it was the turbine uh, propulsion, uh, steam propulsion. Um, and and that, that made all of, all of the battleships that were built before that completely obsolete because the Dreadnought was bigger, faster, had bigger guns and uh, more armor on it, like thicker armor and, and um, you know, like everything was, had armor on it. And so it could go further on, on less, uh, with less resources and go faster, right? And the reason that it makes a big difference, the, the speed and the range of, uh, or, or sorry, the size of their guns, uh, for one thing, like a bigger gun makes a bigger bang, right? But more than that, the bigger gun had a longer range so that you could have this, you know, like let's say, I'll just use a number, okay? Let's say you were 10 kilometers apart from each other here, right? 
uh, this guy's got a range of 8 and this guy's got a range of 12 well this guy all he had to do was sit 10 kilometers away and blast away at this guy and there's nothing he could do about it and being faster than him you know like if the guy tried to get closer well you just move away from him so what with the old ones uh, the they call them pre-dreadnoughts now because after the dreadnought was built then everything after that was called a dreadnought um, after the very first one the HMS dread, dreadnought right but anyway um, the, these ones had a combination they had some big guns but they also had a lot of little guns they kind of thought oh you'll you'll shoot off your big guns and you'll start getting closer and then you'll use the little guns right <laughs> you know kind of like what they did back when they had wooden ships right they hadn't adjusted their thinking yet but these guys they had nothing but big guns they had a few smaller guns but like they had a lot of big guns and, and way bigger, right? And so they could just blast away. And one of the reasons that was so important was because um, of all the splashes in the water. Like if you had a, a ship like this and it had big guns and little guns and they were shooting and you had you seen the splashes, right? Well, you couldn't tell the difference between whether that was a, a splash from a big gun or a splash from a little gun or a splash from a medium gun. So you didn't know which gun to adjust the distance for but with these ones they all shot the same gun right and it was huge and so oh okay we need to shoot a little bit further right so you adjusted it and then all the guns blasted oh that's a little bit too far right and then they adjusted again until you honed in on the ship that you were trying to hit so you know basically these ones made these ones completely obsolete but they didn't just throw them away because there were so many of them right they uh they they kept them around and they were good for uh, protecting the home country right like they were still good against cruisers and and all kinds of things you know and they still had big guns on them and everything they just couldn't stand up to uh, a dreadnought class and uh, by the time the uh, World War one started uh, like the dreadnought was invented in 1906 or the first one was laid down anyway um, by the time World War one came along that dreadnought was was no good anymore because the propulsion had gotten even better and the guns were even bigger right and it just went from there they, they started calling them super dreadnoughts and and there was an arms race that began and, and it was uh it was so big this arms race that they actually uh, had a treaty the washington naval treaty of 1922 where they limited the you you couldn't build battleships anymore and so people tried to get around that right that's why battle cruisers were so valuable because they uh just about as powerful as a battleship they were fast as a cruiser right <laughs> they, were, they were kind of fudging it a bit right and you know by the time they were getting close to world war ii nobody really cared anymore about the treaty they just you know okay try to stop this kind of thing right so anyway that's a bit of the history of of the different ship types that we have here so we have cruisers we have pre-dreadnoughts and like these things will go the furthest right uh these things are very valuable in this game uh these things they don't go very far at all. Think coastal defense ships in the 36 games. That's what these are like. That's why I painted them gray. And then these would be just like a battleship, right? Um, and anyway, th those are your, your ship type. Let's just take a look at these, uh, these dreadnoughts here. So the first one is a Conan class dreadnought. And all of these are available from historical board gaming, right? Then we have the Kaiser class. We have the Helgoland class. Uh, we have the Nassau class and then here's a Durflinger class battle cruiser. You'll notice there's a few battle cruisers on the site. Um, you'll just use those as dreadnoughts. You know, like if you like that sculpt, it's fine to get the, the battle cruiser sculpt and use it as a dreadnought because we don't have battle cruisers in this game. Who knows, maybe someday, you know, maybe version two or version three or something like that. But for now, you can just use a uh, battle cruiser the same as a dreadnought. Um, anyway, that's the Germans. So let's just pause this and we'll move on to the British. Okay, so here we have the British Royal Navy. And you can see the boats up top there, the white one and the blue one and the submarines. Those are the same as the Germans. I, all of those boats, those four boats, I used the same sculpt for everybody. Uh, just to make it a little bit easier and you can see that I color coded them as well, right? Um, so anyway, let's move on. Now, we don't have yet a... Uh, a pre-dreadnought, but it's coming real soon for the British. Uh, Germany's, I think, the first nation that we had where we've we've got everything out already, right? Uh, the British Navy, we are just short of 
the the pre-dreadnought but anyway the armored cruiser so if you look at the masts on these ones like this is one that he sent me earlier and i told him look you know i had a few broken masts you know they're okay if i'm really careful with me because nope that's not good enough so he sent me some new ones and these ones are much better i didn't none of these broke on me these masts and so that's what we're shooting for so um that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm getting all these early and everything is, is so that we can try to work these things out right. Uh, but again, if you get one, then you just let him know and he'll send it on your next order. So anyway, that's the Minotaur Armored Cruiser. And we've talked about the difference between all the boats before. And then the first one on your left over there, that's the Agincourt um, uh, Dreadnought. And then you have the Iron Duke next to it. And then the Queen Elizabeth class, that would be the third one there. Now the Queen Elizabeth class was the first um, one that was built that was the classified as the Super Dreadnought. Uh, so then next to that we have the King George class. And then the last one over there is, um, is the HMAS Australia. I assume HMAS uh, is His Majesty's Australian Service because we also up here in Canada we have HMCS which is His Majesty's Canadian Service. And actually now it's Her Majesty's, right? So it just depends on if you have a king or a queen at the time, right? Um, anyway, so that is the British Navy there. And the British Navy was by far the biggest Navy in the world leading up to the, um, leading up to the First World War. In fact, it was written right into their laws, British law, that they had to have more ships than the second place and the third place army or navies put together, whoever they were, you know, whether it was France and Spain or Germany or whoever, they had to have as much as number two and number three that was written right into their laws. So they kind of screwed themselves when they, when they uh, built the dreadnought because um, now they only had one battleship, right? <laughs> and and uh, then an arms race began. But again, like the, the, the dreadnought, they actually built in uh, a year and a day, like 366 days, they built that dreadnought. It was by far the fastest anybody had ever built a battleship before. Um, they just wanted to see if it could be done. Anyway, they just started just building like you wouldn't believe because they knew that they wanted to stay ahead of everybody. They were the ones with the big empire in the world at the time. like all of the colonies all around the world and they needed to protect all of those right uh so anyway they had lots of cruisers and lots of uh dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts um anyway <laughs> so that's the royal navy so far for the austrian navy um we all we have right now is the uh the dreadnought and that's this one here that's called the ersatz monarch and again these other ships are the same now with both the uh, Ottoman Navy and the Austrian Navy, they are very small and they don't make a lot of money. So they're not going to be building a lot of ships, if any. And here, might as well just, just do the Ottomans. They're right next door there too. So the same thing with the Ottomans, that, um, that holds true for both of them. Again, all they have is their dreadnought, which is actually a, uh, a battle cruiser. And uh, let me see, where is that? Yeah, that's the Yavuz. I think that they still um, use that in World War II. A lot of, a lot of uh, the dreadnoughts, uh, super dreadnoughts uh, were used, or battle cruisers. Like this was built as a battle cruiser. It was actually put down as the Goben battle cruiser. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But anyway, they, they named it later after one of their historical figures, Yavuz Sultan Selim. Uh, so uh, anyway, both of those navies there, you're probably not going to build in, in very many ships. I put down two cruisers for each of them, but there's no cruisers in their opening setup. So you may never ever see a cruiser on the board for them. However, the, th the thing is there's diplomacy in this game and it's built right into the game. And you'll see later there's uh, ships for the neutrals, right? And so you might just happen to uh, influence a neutral that has a cruiser or a pre-dreadnought. Uh, we haven't built any or we haven't ma made any pre-dreadnoughts for these guys yet. I don't know if we will because again very small navies we might not make any cruisers or pre-dreadnoughts for them. There's other kind of cruisers that you can use like the Italian Navy up there. I'm using a British cruiser right. Um, anyway so 
Um, I'm not sure if we're going to make any of those for uh, for the near future. They might, though. I could be wrong. <laughs> he might have plans already. They might come out next week, for all I know, right? But uh, again, they're, they're not going to use very many. There's actually a lot of pre-dreads in the neutral navies, but not a lot of uh, cruisers. I think there's only four cruisers and seven pre-dreads and there's no dreads uh, no subs uh, just a lot of torpedo boat destroyers and, and a few uh, transports but anyway those those are things that you might get if you influence uh, one of the neutral powers right so uh, there's those ones while we're there we might as well do the Italians so I talked a little bit about ironclads or at least I mentioned them they were the precursor to the pre-dread now the, we do have an ironclad here and it looks pretty cool so I thought I'd use it because they don't have a pre-dread anyway that thing was taken out of service just before World War One um, but that doesn't mean you can't use it in this game for a sculpt right use it for your pre-dread and they do have a pre-dread in their opening setup and then the cruiser there is a C-class light cruiser. Uh, it was built by the British. Um, anyway, the, with the C-class light cruisers, there was a, they built 28 of them in seven different classes. And the, all those classes started with C, like Kaliup and, and you know, like they all had a name that started with C, right? And so they were just referred to as C-class. And I'm not sure which one that is because I was doing research on them and I, they all look the same. <laughs> to me, they look like the same damn cruiser. So anyway, it's a C-class cruiser that I'm using for the Italians uh, in the game. And then the dreadnought there is the Conti di Cavour. And uh, that was their dreadnought at the time. So let's move on to France next. Okay, so there's the French Navy there. Now, um, again, all the boats that um, are the same, the the transport, transport and the torpedo boat destroyer and the subs. Uh, I also threw the cruiser in there. That's the Axis and Allies cruiser. You're fine just to use that as your cruiser, right? Uh, that's what I was using. That's why that guy's already painted. Um, but uh, the French cruiser ought to be out really soon here, uh, a 3D printed one. And so uh, when that comes out, then I'll be getting that. Anyway, uh, you look at the pre-dread there. And that is the Messina class pre-dread. And then on the left side, we have the Britannia uh, battleship and the Corbet battleship beside it. Uh, they were dreadnoughts. So you, uh, dreadnoughts and battleships are the same thing. Um, but in, in our game in World War I, we call them dreadnoughts, but it's okay if you slip like I just did and, and call it a battleship. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what they were. Anyway, so let's move on and we'll take a look in the Pacific Ocean after this. For the Russians, we have, uh, what is that cruiser? Oh, this is the Pilau class light cruiser. Now that's something that you'll find in the German um, section of the, pre, uh, the, the 3D printed. And the reason I, I used that for the Russians was because we didn't have a 3D printed Russian one yet. Uh, I don't know if we will. But that Pilau cruiser was built specifically for the Russians. The Germans built it for them. Um, and then World War I broke out and they were on the opposite side. So I, I, they, didn't, they didn't deliver them, I don't think. But anyway, that doesn't mean, you know, like history didn't change. And uh, I, that's what I'm using, right? Is the Pilo class light cruiser. Then you've got your, uh, your Borodino um, pre-dreadnought. That's actually a really nice one. I really like that one. It's one of my favorite ones. Anyway, um, then this one's actually a Borodino class. Like these are both Borodino class, but this is the battle cruiser. You see the difference with the battle cruisers. They're generally longer and thinner, right? Um, anyway, so that's the Borodino battle cruiser. Uh, again, using it as a dreadnought. And then the Imperator Nikolai is the, uh, it's a pure dreadnought, right? From, from World War I. Uh, so let's just slide it on over here to the Japanese. And uh, now the cruiser, again, I'm using the same cruiser, the Pilau class cruiser right here. Uh, and as far as the pre-dread, we don't have one of those yet. So what I'm using is the Fuso class uh, early war battleship. The, it was a plastic piece. Um, in the battle pieces from HPG and I don't know if we will have a, a 
a pre-dreadnought so if that doesn't happen I mean you can see it's a little bit smaller than these so you know perfect for for using for this uh, for this purpose right uh, because it, it fits the uh, <laughs> fits the mold right and then as far as the battleships there there's uh, the East um, it was built in World War uh, one and I think it was actually 1918. It, it, this one is actually the Hayuga. And then here, that is the Congo battle cruiser. Now, you know, you've heard of the Congo. Well, it was actually built in World War I, and it was still in use in World War II, like a lot of the ships were, right? Anyway, so that is uh, uh, the Japanese Navy. So let's just move over here to China. China doesn't matter. You're never going to use these boats. Um, if Japan ends up on the side of the Central Powers, they might go in there and beat them up. But I mean, that's that's going to be a pretty short battle, right? Uh, so I just use any sculpts uh, like these. Uh, this is uh, the the British battle cruiser, or sorry, the British uh, armored cruiser, the Minotaur, with broken masts. I thought, who cares, right? <laughs> these ships don't really mean anything. They're never going to leave China. Um, anyway, so that is uh, the Chinese Navy. Then let's move over here and take a look at the American Navy. The Americans actually got some pretty nice ones here. So you see up there, same four boats as the other one. And then here we have got the Tennessee class armored cruiser. That's a pretty nice sculpt there. Here, let's just take a look at that one a bit. Ooh, fumble fingers there. That's a pretty nice one. And then you got your Virginia class pre-dreadnought. Um, and then we have the Florida class. This just came out at Historical Board Gaming. That's the Florida class dreadnought. And the Idaho class is next to that. That's been on their website for a long, long time. You used to be able to get it from, um, whoa, what is that place called? Shapeways, right? But uh, and that was on there a long time. And then you might recognize this one. This is a Tennessee class battleship. Well, that was built in World War I. It was built as a, as a super dreadnought. And that was actually uh, in Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. But it, it was in World War I. <laughs> That's how old that, that Tennessee class battleship is. And in fact, there was two of these. Like there was a, they had a sister ship. Uh, what was it called? I don't know. I don't want to say the wrong one right now. But um, there was two of those that were in Battleship Row um, and they got nailed by the Japanese. Anyway, let's just, uh, there's only one, actually two left to go. So this is the neutrals here. Now the neutrals doesn't matter, right? You can use anything you want. And so, you know, like uh, again, just using the torpedo boat destroyers and the, the, the troop transports. And then cruisers, I just decided to use whatever cruisers I had, right? Like I had the Tennessee, and the Pilau and the Minotaur and so actually I think I'm using two Minotaurs. Um, oh, this is the Greek Navy and it, it could have been white as well but it's just that uh, the Greeks have an opportunity to be a part of the uh, the prequel in the game so I gave them their own color but I mean they're just a neutral as well uh, I'm using the Virginia class pre-dreadnought there. Now this this dreadnought here, there's actually six or seven of these. This is the, um, what is that? Slush wing, slush wig or whatever. It's uh, They've been selling it for years at Historical Board Gaming. That is a, a plastic piece, right? Now that is actually a Deutschland class pre-dreadnought. That's what that is. They were still using this in World War II, unbelievably. Anyway, so I had a bunch of them, right? Like I was using that for the German pre-dreadnought until I got the uh, the 3D printed ones. And I thought, well, you know, I might as well just uh, make this into my neutral because I, I happen to have just the right amount of them. So anyway, uh, that's my neutrals there. And there's just one more thing to mention, and that is the Ukraine. So I've only got one Ukrainian boat there. You can see him up there. Um, so I can't tell you what you're going to need for the Ukraine. What, what happens is when Russia falls, like if it, if it falls, if and when it falls, uh, goes into revolution, then the boats that the Russians have in here become Ukrainian. 
because uh, the Ukraine is down in here, right? And so like I'll, you'll be putting Ukrainian units on the board and whatever is here for a Navy is uh, re becomes Ukrainian. Now you don't really have to do anything. Like you could just leave Russian boats in there. They're not going to go anywhere, honestly. Um, the Ukrainian Navy is not going to sail out of there. Uh, the revolution and the civil war was an internal conflict. And so, you know, like they're not gonna go down and attack uh, Turkey or anything like that, right? They're gonna stay right there. So um, do what you want there, right? Um, if you don't have the money, then don't worry about doing anything. Um, or if you want to, then, you know, I would not do more than one boat each, like one transport, one torpedo boat destroyer, one cruiser, uh, one pre-dreadnought, and it's highly unlikely you'll ever need a dreadnought there. But maybe you do. May, you know, like you can, you, if you got an extra one, then sure, paint that one up too, right? Uh, but, you know, it, it, chances are the Russians are not going to put a dreadnought there, right? And so um, that's it. And, and like if you happen to have two torpedo boats there, that's fine. You can just put a chip under one of them. Like I said, nothing's going to happen there anyway. Um, those ships are going to become Ukrainian, but they're not going to do anything and nobody's going to attack them. At least I, I don't believe they are. I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where they would want to attack and, and lose their own ships just to take some Ukrainians out, right? Uh, who are not their enemy. <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, that's it. So we'll come back in a second and we'll finish this off. So I hope that this video has been helpful to you. And it's given you some idea of um, what you might need. Um, like I said, this video will be more helpful to you if you're planning on building your navies with uh, the 3D printed sculpts. And that's mostly the people that I did this video for. But it does give you uh, uh, some insight into what you're going to need regardless uh, if you're planning on building your navy before the ships come out for... Um, uh, for the specifically for the 1914 game um, anyway uh, I'm really looking forward to the game coming out it's looking like it won't be out until next spring um, and uh, I can't wait like it's 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 a really good game and uh, I can't wait for you to play it because like it, it's like the 36 game you know it's got it's got all that complexity and all the different directions that you can take it in right but it's a much different game like the the game is uh, a lot of it is technology driven because this was the first war that was fought in the modern era in fact this war actually dragged the rest of the world into the modern era right like <laughs> they just learned how to fly just before this war began you know like they just started building internal combustion engines for ground vehicles right and so they're like uh, uh the, the the game reflects that like when you start the game uh there's not much technology and as you move through the game the technology chart is actually pretty important because that'll allow you to do more things right um it's not just uh giving you super weapons or anything like that you know like you can't build tanks until you develop them right um, and planes they get developed as time goes on uh, bombers you can't use bombers unless you develop them right and so it's like that right um, the torpedo boat destroyers become better if you develop that technology but the, you know like if you're the Russians you don't really need that technology right <laughs> the British do um, so anyway uh, I'm really looking forward to, to having this game come out and and to having you guys play it Anyway, that's all for that I've got for today. So take care, everyone. General Hand Grenade, out.